I had had a mentor or someone to guide me in the beginning, my learning curve would have been shorter. If I had somebody like you that would lend me private money, I would have made more money. And so I, honestly, people can never go wrong by having somebody with experience help them and guide them. And if you're a real estate investor and are wondering how to raise and leverage private money to make more profit on every deal, then you're in the right place. On Raising Private Money, we'll speak with new and seasoned investors to dissect their deals and extract the best tips and strategies to help you get the money, because the money comes first. Now here's your host, Jay Connor. Welcome to another amazing episode of Raising Private Money. I'm Jay Connor, your host, and today have we got an amazing guest. Oh my lands, my guest today has raised in millions and millions of private money, and we're going to talk about exactly how she's done it. Now, let me ask you a question. When you hear the word foreclosures, do your ears perk up a little bit or do you dream of owning your own business and being financially free and setting your own schedule and taking the vacations when you want to? Well, guess what? My guest is going to reveal in this episode and the conversation we're going to have exactly how she has gone about doing it. Now, first of all, her background story, she started as a broke single mom who can, who had been, can you believe fired from Denny's for goodness sakes. So having nowhere to go, but up, that's how she actually, or when she started rehabbing foreclosures. Well, fast forward to about 30 years up until now, her insane amount of investing knowledge and her unique and very open style, down to earth personality, make her a very highly sought after podcast guest. In fact, I have talked her into agreeing to answer any real estate question that we throw her way. Now, her motto that she lives by is, quote unquote, people before profits. Now, in addition to that, She's written three best-selling uh, books. She's a celebrity guest speaker on Fox and Friends, MSNBC, local news channels, Naomi Judd's morning show. I mean, she's been everywhere and with everybody. In addition to that, she's closed now over 2,000 real estate deals by flipping and rehabbing. Now, her current project is unbelievably huge. You might as well say that she and her family have bought an entire town and they're in the midst of restoring this town. We definitely want to hear that story. In just a moment, you're going to meet my dear friend and special guest, Miss Dwan Bent Twyford, right after this. Dwan, welcome to the show. Hi, honey. I'm so excited to see you. You look exactly the same. <laughs> you know what? That reminds me. There's three stages of life, Dwan. There's youth, middle age, and you look exactly the same. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's youth, middle age, and then we get youth again. That's right. That's right. Well, it's so good to have you back on Raising Private Money. It's been uh, it's been a little while since we visited here on the show. And so what I'd like to do, Dwan, is first, let's spend a few minutes and talk about what you have to share about raising private money, because the audience loves to hear how very successful people such as yourself have gone about raising private money. And then I want us to move into your expertise and get as much advice as we can uh, in the um, 30 minutes or so that we've got together. So as far as raising private money go, you've raised millions and millions and millions of private money. It's been my experience that a lot of other real estate investors had a similar story to mine. Uh -huh. And that is I had a big problem come along in my investing career to where I was shut down at the banks. I couldn't borrow any money. The finan global financial crisis was going on. And that is that time in 2009 that I learned about private money yes. and it became the biggest blessing in disguise in my business. What's your story as to what triggered you to start raising private money? Well, you know, um, when I first started, I started off as a rehabber. So <clears throat> I was getting houses, you know, moving into the houses, fixing them up, selling them, moving into the next rehab. And that's what I was doing. So after 
my first deal, um, I needed money to buy a rehab. So I started using local hard money lenders down here in South Florida, like in the Fort Lauderdale, West Palm Beach area. So I started using hard money lenders probably for, I don't even know, five or six or seven years. And I was like, you know what? I know so many people that have money and friends of my parents and my dad and just aunts and uncles. So I was like, hey, you know, I need a little money for this and for that. And then like they would have a friend that would, you know, have some money. Next thing you know, I had all these people that were willing to lend me money all over the place. And then that turned into me training thousands and thousands of students. And some of them started making really big money. I'm like, you need to become a, a private money lender. So then I like, trained a bunch of people to be lenders and they've lent out millions of dollars too. So mine that came out, like you said, came out of necessity. I, I started as a rehabber. I only knew that one technique and I didn't have any money or any credit because I'd gone through a divorce, a foreclosure and had my car repossessed. So I had, I probably couldn't even have bought a pack of gum on credit. And so it was due to, I needed it to make my business work. Exactly. Well, and I bring, I'm glad you bring up the, the contrast between hard money and private money, because a lot of times when real estate investors hear the word private money, they're thinking hard money. Yes, and there's a are. big difference. <laughs> there's it a big difference. <clears throat> big difference between hard money and, and private money. Um, what are, what are some of the, um, <clears throat> what are some, in your experience, what are some of the big difference between a hard money broker and then doing business with individuals that, loan you money on your deals, either from investment capital and or their retirement accounts? Yeah, a, a lot of them use retirement accounts. So I'm glad you said that. I've got, uh, I don't even know. I've got, it's so funny how, you know, when you're new, like nobody wants to give you money. And then after you become like sort of semi-famous, everybody in the world wants to give you money. They're like begging you. And then at that point, you don't really need it anymore because you're like, okay, I've got my own money. But I like people, I have a lot of people that do money out of their retirement funds and things like that. And the loans are uh, sometimes a little principal and interest. Uh, they might be a little bit longer, like a two year or three year or five year note. And they're not like hard money is like, you know, here's the money is for six months, it's interest only. You better get that house sold. And with the private money, I find them to be more amenable to lengthening the term of the loan or um even lending like we bought a couple commercial buildings and some lenders lent us some money to buy the buildings and you know it's like amortized over 30 years but in five years we have to you know refinance it and stuff so i think as you do the private you it's it's just easier uh the terms are easier and once you work with someone a couple times and they make a bunch of money back they tell their friends and then everybody and their brother is wanting to give you money for everything so I, I would always go to private money versus hard money. But in the very beginning, that's all I could do was get hard money. But it didn't take long for me to be like, that's a racket. <laughs> <laughs> and like exactly. back then they were charging 15% interest only and like 10 points. It's like, golly, what a racket that is. Right, right. So really what you're saying when you're doing business with uh, private lenders, individuals, you as the real estate investor, you as the borrower, we get to make the rules instead of the lender. <laughs> it's so much easier. We have got a few people that lend us money for things. And as soon as we pay them back, they're always like, hey, listen, we, we want to lend you guys some more money, buy something else. And in Iowa, that town we're working in, we bought uh, 28 buildings all together. And some of them we paid for, some of them we borrowed some money on. And people are just like, they're, they're excited to help you because they're making, you know, 10 times the money they're going to make in their 401k or their IRA or whatever they've got going on. They're going to make so much more money. And, you know, then they can put that money back with the profit and they can build their long-term wealth because they can, you know, put the money back in that they made. And they're really excited to help and be a part of it. I find, I find all the ones I work with, they're like happy to be like, what's going on? Show me some pictures. How's the building going? And, you know, they feel like they're part, they're like a part of something. 
I love it. Now, you know, you've worked uh, as I have with um, a lot of students, help people get going into real estate investing. In your years of uh, of doing that, Duan, what is or are some of the most common mistakes that you see a new real estate investor making? Oh, Lord. How, how many hours do we have? <laughs> <laughs> Well, and really the more important, the more important follow-up question to that is, and whatever you say, the common mistakes are that you've seen, what can they do not to make those mistakes? <laughs> well, okay. So first thing, and not to give a shameless plug to either one of us, but really, if I had had a mentor or someone to guide me in the beginning, my learning curve would have been shorter. If I had somebody like you that would lend me private money, I would have made more money. And so I, honestly, people can never go wrong by having somebody with experience help them and guide them. And like you specialize in hard money. I mean, gosh, you could help a million people probably raise hard money. And so my first thing is don't try to reinvent the wheel because it's already been invented. Find someone you like and that you feel like your moral compass is aligned and work with that person. So that's my first thing, because I, I tell people all the time, you're going to learn by mentors or mistakes. Mentors are cheaper. Amen. I, I mean, it, God, I just, I, you know, I learned, I started in like 1990 and there was no real internet. Nobody was traveling around doing big seminars. And I learned Sharon and I work together. We learn everything by the seat of our pants. And it's sort of painful, it. isn't it? It is because you make mistakes and then you look back, you're like, oh man, that was such a bonehead mistake. How did I do that? But you don't know any different. So my first thing is the biggest mistake people make is thinking they can just listen to this piece of a webinar and this piece of a webinar and watch, you know, this podcast and they go, oh, I can, I can become a successful real estate investor because I listen to 15 people give me a tidbit and it's not right. a system. Like it's, you need a system. And like with, with money, like people come to you with, and you teach them how to raise private money. It's so much easier than the hard money lenders. because They're like tyrants, you know, really. I mean, they are. And I've had to ask for extensions and it's like, it's terrible. And especially when I was new and didn't know that much about business, I was so intimidated by all of them. I was like, yeah, I don't know. These people scare, the, scare me to death. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I think I think it's really important for uh, any investor, new or seasoned, listen to podcasts, get on webinars, come and see people like you, come and see people like me. And then, like I said, don't think, oh, I've got 25 pieces of information. I know everything there is to know because you know and I know that new people don't know what they don't know. Exactly. And they get their panties in a bunch on their first or second deal and they quit. Like, oh, I lost money or this didn't work out. I didn't make as much profit because the house needed so much work or whatever. And one deal can put them out of business. And if they had someone to help them, they like me, like I'm almost 2,500 deals in and I'm rehabbing a town. Like I would never have thought a girl that got fired on Denny's at third shift would be rehabbing a town. Like who does that? <laughs> you know. <laughs> Sometimes I'm just like, are we seriously rehabbing a town? Like, Bill, what are we doing? But it's it's a challenge because it's all new. I so love 30 it. years later, you can still find new things to do. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that, Dwan. Now, we have got a very interesting market going on right now. All kinds of different variables are playing into what's going on. I mean, interest rate, mortgage rates that a borrower would be paying are out of sight again uh, in our area and still in a lot of areas, there's no inventory. You know, and you put it in the model. I put a house in the multiple listing service with my realtor a couple of Fridays ago, and we had 22 showings in, yeah. by, in, in 48 hours. Yeah. Um, and so today's real estate market, and should somebody that's new be concerned about entering this market at this time? Well, Jay, you know, you and I know something that we know it's true to be a fact. Whether the market's going up or the market's going down, people are always making money. And 
So if the market's going up, we can figure out how to make money. If the market's tanking, we can still figure out how to make money. And I feel like people uh, that are new are so concerned about what they hear on the news and what they hear about the market and interest rates. Oh my God, I can't, I can't get investing in right now. But at the end of the day, I work with people in foreclosure. So whether the market's up or down, the reasons for foreclosure remain the same. People are dying. People are getting a divorce. People are losing a job. People are getting job transfers. Like the reasons for the foreclosures are the same regardless of what the market's doing. So there's so my my thing, even still, and it's been almost 35 years now, um, I still like to work with people that are in foreclosure or distress because they don't have anywhere to go. And there's nobody to help them except for investors. So the people that I work with and the reason I work with them, it doesn't change. So people are dying every day, being born every day. People are getting sick every day. People are getting divorced every day, like losing jobs. Like it's the same. So there's never a shortage of people that need your help. There's never a shortage of, of any deals out there, regardless of what the market is doing. I think people that rely more on agents or they rely more on um that kind of stuff maybe they have a little bit more difficult time but i stay focused on the people that are in trouble because that's how i started i lost my house and my car and my husband and all the money and i got to keep my daughter and i was like i was like a homeowner <laughs> and nobody came knocked on my door and tried to help me so it's like okay and the market was amazing you know and so i'm just like i so i think people kind of need to choose a lane and what they want to do and, and what they're excited about but they definitely need to have access to private money like there's all your deals you're going to run across things where you need money to buy houses or to do rehab or to do whatever it is you want to do or buy buildings or or multi-units or whatever people need to have access to money and that's what scares people when the interest rates get high and people oh the market they think there's no money out there but there's probably more I mean, you can attest there's probably more money available right now because the people that have the money aren't making as much. Yeah, I mean, you're exactly right, Vaughn. I mean, since this side of COVID, I've got more private money chasing me yeah. than even before uh, COVID. I mean, before COVID, there was $18 trillion in cash sitting on the sidelines here in the United States that could be used as private money. And today there's 31 trillion yeah. sitting on the sidelines. And, you know, one thing, you know, you were talking about crazy interest rates that pay, uh, people have to, when they borrow hard money, have to pay. Well, you know, that's out of sight now. But the beautiful thing about the private money <laughs> is I'm still paying my private lenders the same 8% yes. that I started paying them back in 2009. And, and other real estate investors, particularly new ones, will say, well, Jay, interest rates have gone up quite a bit since 2009, like, um, how are you still able to pay 8%? And I said, because we make the rules. And even though you can go down to the local bank now and get a 5% APR for an eight month CD certificate of deposit, 8% is still a whole lot more than that. So we yeah. make the rules. And that's the thing. People that are new, they can't grasp that concept. It's like you make the rules. Like you're lending the money. We lend money to people all the time. And all my students that start making money, I'm like, listen, become a lender. Stop putting money in a CD. What's a CD get? Like 2%. And and if it's in like all your retirement, it's just, it's it's not high. And it goes up and down with the market. And it's the private money. And, you know, like someone's doing 8%, they're always getting that. And that's so much more than they can make any other way. And they're sitting on all that cash. So let them make a good amount of money. And then as you borrow it and pay it back and borrow it and pay it back, then they beg you, do you have friends that I can give them money? And then people line up and they're begging you to take their money. I love it. And people Wait. don't realize that new investors, I did not realize that for probably honestly a decade. Right. And then all of a sudden I was like, I have wasted millions of dollars on hard money lenders. And now for like the last 20 years, it's like, I don't even know what the hell I was thinking back then. <laughs> you don't well, know. You don't know. 
Well, you know, when you're starting out and you and if you don't get a coach or a mentor like you were talking about, you don't know what you don't know. Well, Dwan, you know, there's all kinds of opportunities to invest in real estate, single family houses. I mean, even with single family houses, of course, you, you know, you're you're an expert in the foreclosures, but there's short sales, there's flipping, there's fix and flip. And then there's becoming a landlord, you know, long term buy and hold. Um, what what do you like the best and what don't you like and why? You know, uh, it's a, that's funny because I start off as a rehabber. And the only reason I started as a rehabber is because I met some people and they said, we're real estate investors, we buy houses, we fix them up and we sell them. So I thought, okay, they buy them, they fix them up, they sell them. So I only knew that thing. And then, um, I don't know, two or three years in the early 90s, a RIA group opened up in South Florida. And I was like, oh, you know, back then we had to find everything for all you youngsters in the classified section of the newspaper. There was an ad, real estate investors group meeting over here at this hotel. And I was like, wow, there's other investors in, in Fort Lauderdale and West Palm Beach. I'm going to go to that meeting. There was like 100 people there. And I was like, holy cow, there's investors everywhere. And so then you start learning. And so then I discovered wholesaling. So for like a decade, I wholesaled like a hundred deals a year. I was an insane, crazy wholesaling person. But then I'm realizing wholesaling is a job. And if you don't have something to bring in money, you're working basically forever till the end of time. And I started buying rentals and then I did not know how to be a landlord. So my first five rentals, I sold them because I hated tenants calling me and, oh, Miss Dwan, I'm going to be late. Can you not charge me a late fee? And then I took a couple of classes and learned that I was doing it wrong. And uh, so now I'm all about being a landlord. And then, you know, my husband and I had some opportunities like to buy some commercial buildings. We're like, oh, that sounds like fun. Let's do that. That'll be fun. So there's not, and I know this maybe sound like a vague answer. There's not anything I don't like about real estate investing. So I love wholesaling. I love rehabbing. Um, I love being a landlord, but right. And I love teaching because I see people that are barely getting by become millionaires. I'm like, ah, oh, I had a hand in that. I thank you, Jesus. But what I'm really into right now is rehabbing this town. So this is brand new. Maybe when I'm done, I might write a program or a book about it or something. But it's so much fun to take old buildings and restore them back and rent out all the commercial spaces and they bring in so much money. It's like, Oh my God, the money is insane. It's insane. So tell us the story of renovating a town. <laughs> how did this, how did this come about? And what, uh, in the world does that, what does that look like? So you'll, you'll appreciate this story, Jay. So <clears throat> Bill's from a town called Clinton, Iowa. And Clinton, Iowa was right on the Mississippi river. So like there's all these river towns, there's a bridge and over the bridge there is um, Illinois. So Iowa, Illinois, so it's right there. And uh, back in the day, Clinton, Iowa had more millionaires in a small space because everyone was a land baron, uh, uh, like a wood, a wood. I don't know what they call it. They were like low lumber. They were lumber barons because they have a baseball team called the Lumber Kings. They were lumber barons because the train came through, the ships came through. And every, so there was so many rich people, so many big, giant, beautiful buildings and beautiful mansions. And the town was really the thing in the 50s, 60s, 70s. And then the downtown, the businesses started moving over here, like out of town, a casino, the Walmart, a Target, all the restaurants. And people stopped coming downtown. And they started going out there where like all the new stuff was. And so many of the buildings just were sitting there vacant for decades. So, so it came about, Bill and I went to a high school reunion and we were still dating. And I was like, oh, this old town, oh my God, it's so cute. It just needs some love. And so we went back for a five year, another reunion. I was like, no one's doing anything with this downtown. In fact, it looks worse than it did. And then we went back to another reunion so that's the 15 year mark. I'm like, listen, we need to buy some buildings. We need to call some people, see if there's some kind of rejuvenation program or, you know, what we can do to, to try to help like revitalize this old downtown that looks like someone just stepped away from it and left it back in time. And we saw a few businesses opening and people trying to come in, but not enough to like 
bring it back. So, you know, Bill and I, we don't do anything small. So no, we bought don't. a building and then we bought it from this woman who told her friend, Carol, she's like, hey, I've got three buildings. My husband's been dead for a decade. Will you take my three buildings? And we're like, oh, only if you own or finance them. We can't put any money down. Like just so she owned or finance three. And then her friend says, hey, I've got two more buildings over here. <laughs> and all these little, they must all belong to like the Rotary Club. And they're all in their 70s. And like, we all want to move to Florida. We hate Iowa. We just want to get out. Can you just mail us money? Send us a check every week. And we just want, all want to move. And so we, so through that, we ended up with like 15. Which, Good and night. I was like, Bill, stop buying buildings. <laughs> All of them have to be brought back up and they all need a lot of work. Stop buying belly. But yeah, at this point, Jay, all the women were like, well, we'll just finance it for you. So we can't give any money down because they need work. And every single person just wrote out a mortgage, 30 year amortized. We told them we'd refinance it in five or seven years, all of them. So it was the craziest thing to be able to get all that money. Wow. So then, so what happened? So the downtown, it's three blocks by three blocks. That's so nine little blocks. So all the taxes that we pay goes into a downtown revitalization fund. <clears throat> and then they have a meeting where everyone gets together and you have to own a building. Every building is a parcel. And you they vote on things. So we were like, hey, listen, I watch Hallmark. Let's have a fall festival. Let's have a spring festival. Let's have a music festival. Let's do things to bring people downtown. Mm. And everyone kept saying, oh, we tried Christmas in July a decade ago. It didn't work. We tried this eight years ago. It didn't work. We tried this. It didn't work. And everyone kept outvoting us. So then we called the president of the revitalization and said, how many parcels do we have to own to control the vote? Huh? <laughs> so I'm like, listen, we're gangsters. We're OG. We're gangsters. So 28. So we got 28 more parcels and nobody knew we bought them. And the next meeting, we're like... Here's what we're doing. And then they checked, they're like, the Twifers control the vote. And I said, yes, we do. And it's just going to start happening now. So <laughs> now, every Thursday in the summer, they close off the street and have live music. And like 2,000 people come. My word. They've been downtown for decades. And we do Christmas in July. And we do a Valentine's. And we do every two weeks or something happening. And there's still a lot of empty buildings. But we're not buying. So if anybody wants Clinton, Iowa. Come in there, but we're not. I said, so don't you buy another building? I, I will murder you. Like, we are done buying buildings. Um, <laughs> but the the downtown, uh, they did some kind of property evaluation. The property values have gone up 48% Woo. in just the last like four years since we swooped in on the town and started making things happen. So now it's busy, it's more bustly. And we tell all the people if you have a space you want to rent, like don't rent it to a mattress company because that doesn't bring people downtown. Rent it to restaurants and boutiques and antique malls and candy shops and things that will bring people down to like shop in like an old downtown. Like and you see on Hallmark. Do. Yeah, it's like Hallmark. And one of the stores across the street, it's called Doodads. It is a Hallmark store. So they have this really strict calendar they have to follow. Like on Hallmark, if it's like in February, it's Loveuary. And they have all these things. And I said, let's just follow the calendar because Hallmark is tried and true. They make billions and millions of bills of dollars. They make millions of movies all over the world. Follow the calendar. They've proven that these things work. So uh, we're, so we follow the Hallmark calendar. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hey, I'm up. telling you that people were so mad that I we had like for one full year, we voted, we came up with ideas, we laid out plans, we got voted down a lot. And after a year, I was like, listen, these people are too small-minded. We have got to figure out a way, because these people are making me insane. So we just thought, you know, we'll just buy more stuff. So <laughs> <laughs> so when you can't work with other people, control the vote. <laughs> <laughs> There's a right or down or right there. When they won't uh, agree, then just control the situation. Control it. Hey, we, listen, Bill and I, we said... We always tell people that we don't play well with others because we have big ideas. And like you, we have like big ideas and, and we like, we think big, 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 big. And these are, and nothing against the people there, but it's a very small town. 
Some have lived there their whole life. Some of them have a building and live upstairs and their business is downstairs and they run that business. And, and that's a wonderful thing, but they don't think as big as we think. So right. after like a year of getting 90% of my idea shot down, I was just like, that's it. What do we need to do? And so <laughs> we bought some more stuff and got the parcels we needed. Then we walked in like, okay, here's what we're doing from now on. And the place is booming. I love it. I love it. Vaughn, you have, you have got one of the most magnetic, attractive personalities of yeah. anybody I know. You and do too. And my thank you. And my audience is thinking the same thing as they're listening to you. So how can they connect with Dwan Bent Twyford and continue this conversation and continue to learn from you? Well, they can just go to my website, which is Dwanderful. So I took Dwan and wonderful and I made a new word. So I'm <laughs> wonderful. There so you go. So that, that, is everywhere. Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, LinkedIn, everywhere. All right. Everywhere. Let's spell that. Let's spell that for the audience. So that okay, is so www. Dot w a n. Yep. D e r f u l. Dwanderful. Dot com. There you go. And, and of course, all my goodness, all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And uh, and of course, we will have that in the show notes as well. Vaughn, thank you so much for joining me again here on the show. Uh, Jay, I, you know, I have loved you forever, like since forever. So I'm always so excited when I get a chance to see you or talk to you or be on a show with you. Can't wait to have you back on my show again. And it's just such a pleasure. You, you are like the happiest, have the biggest smile and is very contagious. And I <laughs> always love to be in a room with you. God bless you, Dwan. Thank you so much. There you have it. Another amazing episode of Raising Private Money. And wow, did we have not an amazing guest today, my good friend Dwan. Now, I need your help. You know, I don't sell anything here on this show. I don't run any ads on the show. And there's only one thing that I could ask you to do. And it would mean the world to me if you'll do this. Share this episode at least with someone that you know it would make an impact on. If you happen to be watching on YouTube, be sure and ring that bell and subscribe so you don't miss out on any more amazing shows. If you're listening on any of your um, favorite podcast platforms, be sure and follow so you don't miss out. I'm looking forward to seeing you right here on the next episode of Raising Private Money with Jay Connor. Are you feeling inspired by the knowledge you gained in this episode? Then head over to jconner.com slash money guide. That's jconner.com slash money guide and download your free guide that shares seven reasons why private money will skyrocket your real estate investing business right now. Again, that's jconner.com slash money guide to get your free guide. We'll see you next time on Raising Private Money with Jay.